Hey everybody, Countdown VHS here with another update for the mod Total War Wayne Riders for Rome Total War's Alexander Expansion, the original, not the remaster. It has been a little while since we've had an update, and so today I would actually like to show you a little bit of the campaign map. Let's start up a Gondor campaign. Well, here we are for the first time on the campaign map for Total War Wayne Riders, and uh, let me start off with the usual caveat. What you are seeing here is, of course, a work of progress, and pretty much anything you see can and may be changed before the initial release of the mod. Uh, but we've made a lot of progress lately, uh, not me, but everyone else on the team. And so uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to show you what uh, what they've been up to. Uh, some things that definitely will be changed, you may notice resources sprinkled around towns and stuff like that. Obviously, those things are going to be moved. There is not going to be a pot of honey outside of Manus Anor. Uh, there are some other WIP areas, of course. You may notice this little structure here. Uh, that's not going to be around. This is, of course, uh, the location of Amon Anwar, uh, Elendil's tomb, right? And so we're just getting a settlement strat model for that. Uh, but otherwise, there's been quite a few changes. If you remember the old map from Dominion of Men, uh, this is going to look quite different from that from all in all sorts of ways, from the uh, the sky. I mean, if we go down to the sea here, you can see that the, the reflections of the clouds in the sky are going to look different. Uh, the coastlines may look slightly different from what you remember from Dominion of Men. And, uh, of course, the settlements, the vegetation, the trees, uh, just about everything has been reworked. So I want to take you around a tour of, uh, of Gondor, essentially. What does Gondor start off with in uh, Third Age 1864 at the beginning of the mod Total War Wayne Riders? And what can you expect to see on the campaign map? Now, one of the things that I should point out is that we do have three settlements here indeed, minus Honor, Osgiliath, and minus Ithil. Uh, but you're also going to see some of these uh, minor settlements, these uh, these little villages, secondary settlements, they're called currently. Uh, we may change that name in the future. Uh, but these are, sort of take the place of the villages. If you remember from uh, Dominion of Men, there were these minor villages scattered across the map, and those represented uh, land tax. They used the, the mining mechanic to make those appear on the campaign map once you had established your Dominion, and maybe in a few other conditions as well. Uh, so here we've got some visual differences uh, for these. Gondor has uh, this style of minor settlement, and other factions will have different style of minor settlement. So there will be a great deal of variety, not only into how the settlements look in Gondor, you know, between Gondor and a faction like, uh, you know, the, the Western Horde or Harad, uh, but even things like the villages are going to be different. Uh, where should we start here? Well, this area actually is going to boast probably the greatest uh, concentration of settlement diversity, just in terms of, of how they are appearing on the campaign map. You may notice Osgiliath here actually is a thing in our time period, and uh, of course it was, right? Osgiliath was not abandoned until into the third millennium, well into the third millennium uh, of the Third Age. So we've got about a thousand more years of Osgiliath kicking around as a settlement, but of course it had been a long time since the king's house had been moved to Minas Anor. So this is going to be your capital at the beginning of the campaign. Incidentally, if you're wondering why the settlements may look a little different from what you expect, if something seems off about them, that's because I have shut off the parts, the, the I guess, what do you call this? The little tag of uh, written stuff, the names of the settlement, the money that it's making or losing, the alignment, all those types of things. You can shut those off by pressing Control T on the campaign map. I learned that like literally yesterday. So that's a thing you can do if you don't want to show all of the settlement, um, uh, you know, the, the faces and all of that. You just want a nice look at your campaign map overall. Uh, the other thing is banners for armies. I've also shut off. You can do that by pressing the J key. Again, shocking that I didn't stumble into that at some point while playing, you know, Rome Total War for the past, you know, what, almost 20 years now. But there we have it. That's another thing I learned off. Just the J key will get rid of all the banners uh, for your armies and so on. Uh, but anyway, that makes the map look a little less cluttered, but it may look slightly uh, off if you're used to playing with those things on. Uh, so yes, we've got the Ithil region here. Of course, Gondor would control this territory for quite some time, although it has to be said that at the end of the Wayne Rider period here, they would be sorely pressed in the Ithilian region, uh, having to endure an invasion both from north 
and south simultaneously. But we do have some slight different settlement placements down here. Uh, here, for example, uh, is going to be a, another settlement. No longer will there be M and Arnin up in the hills, uh, because that, in terms of gameplay, that would have been... Um, well, just a, a horrible cluster around here. We needed to have the big three, and then having a fourth one right there seems like a bit much. Um, also, something that I've kind of neglected in terms of my, uh, my thoughts about Southern Athelion is that on the maps, uh, particularly the, the zoomed-in map that I think J.R.R. Tolkien himself did uh, of the Gondor and Rohan and Mordor region, I think that one appears in the Two Towers or maybe Return of the King. Uh, anyway, that smaller map, uh, shows clearly a road from Pelargir, you know, uh, and, and crossing and then continuing towards the Harad Road. So there was some connection there. So it seems to make sense that there would be a settlement down here. We also learn about a thousand years in the future, 2884, that when, uh, when the Haradrim had occupied Harondor, south of the Poros, uh, there was fighting along the Poros and they, they pushed just north of it, but not much farther than, than well, just about here. And so that would indicate as well that, that Gondor had some forces uh, able to assemble relatively quickly in southern Athelion. So let's move over down the coast, the mouths of Anduin. There will be another settlement here. This is going to be south of the Poros. Uh, and so Gondor will start with some territory here. They will not be the only one. You may notice there are a couple of rebel settlements to their south and east. Uh, but I believe Harad and, and Umbar start off with some settlements uh, also north of the Harnin. So there may be a bit of random kind of free-for-all going on uh, in this region. Very fun stuff indeed. We also have the presence of Gondor on the island of uh, Tolfalis, I believe it is. Yep, Harlorn here. Uh, and again, settlement names I believe are pretty solid now, but just in case I forget or, or haven't hammered it into your head by now, this is work in progress. Uh, so settlement names, placements, all those types of things. Um, okay, we've also got uh, Pilar gear, of course, the big one. And one of the interesting things about here is the, the ports are a little bit different. So let's move our navy away here. And yes, I believe even the fleets get a bit of, a, a bit of an upgrade. Uh, so here we've got a port. Um, with the settlements also have a bit, of, uh, a bit of a port, I guess you could say, or a seawall sort of extending into the river here. Uh, and there's the little trade ship going in. Very, very nice stuff. Uh, so over in the west of Gondor, a lot of stuff is as you would expect. We've got some settlements here. We've also got, um, got the settlement around Dol Amroth. Again, this is a very new settlement look. And I, since I haven't said it before, I can credit Valor and Weba and Aridan for all of this work. Um, I touched very, very little on the campaign map. Uh, I did something early on. We'll get to that later. Um, but other than that, it's been all of those guys' work. Um, Valor, of course, doing a lot of the visual stuff, the 2D stuff, but also uh, doing a lot of 3D stuff lately, which is quite a challenge, one I have never undertaken myself. Um, Weba, of course, laying a foundation for a lot of this work and helping out and, you know, of course, including with ideas and conversations um, and Eridan helping to implement all of this. And me standing by and encouraging all the while. So... Thank you once again, guys, for all of this hard work. It's been really fantastic to watch it get to this point. Okay, moving on, where do we have up here? We've got Morden, as you would expect, up in the Mormothon Vale. And then over into the west, we've got the wild regions of western Gondor. I don't know exactly why I say wild, but it always seems a little, a little unsettled. Um, much later, we hear about the Anphalus. Like, for the first time, I believe, it's mentioned in the context of Kyrion, uh, or, or someone around that, uh, around that period. I believe it's... Uh, you know, definitely in the period of the stewards. And so it seems that Gondor just didn't have that much of a presence over here. So that may be a weak point, especially considering that you may have some neighbors up to the north. Um, speaking of the north, Gondor also begins play with a considerable presence north of the White Mountains. This is the region that would later be known as Rohan, of course, uh, as well as Anorian, right? But at this period, it is known as Kalinardon, which is very unfortunate because I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. But at any rate, Gondor does begin in possession of a lot of territory here, if not a lot of population. Uh, because one of the trends we observe in Kalinardon's uh, history is that essentially all the way up to the time of Aeorl, the arrival of uh, Aeorl the Young out of the north in the year 2510, Kalinardon's population had been dwindling. Uh, it seems that there was essentially uh, fortifications since uh, the 1200s, I believe. The regent Menalkar established those after a triumphant uh, campaign against the Easterlings in 1248. 
He returned and fortified the line of Anduin, and that is represented by these very nice uh, fort settlements here. You'll notice that the area of these settlements is smaller than, say, this place, which commands, uh, well, all of eastern Kalinardon, and that is because these are going to be not fully-fledged settlements. I believe kind of similar to how in, uh, in Dominion of Men you've got these forts, permanent forts, scattered across the map in particular places. Uh, here, similarly, there are a few places, uh, Ker Andros is one, where there will be these permanent fortifications. Uh, most of them are going to be occurring in the territory of Gondor, as you would imagine, and those will serve to be sort of a, a place of garrison, a central place of location. Not really much in the way of income or building that can be done there, I believe, but these are intended to command strategic points. Um, and that is something that, that actually worked for Gondor all throughout the Wainrider period. They never suffered a crossing over the borders of the Anduin into Kalinardon, at least, at least during the Wainrider times. And another thing that is slightly different about the Athelian region at this point is that we do have a settlement here, Terminas. Um, this is in, uh, yes, North Athelian. We've got uh, Minas Ithil uh, controlling just its Vale. It's not controlling nearly all the territory that it did in Dominion of Men. Uh, the central Athelian region is going to be controlled by Osgiliath, southern Athelian by uh, Aaron Arnen, uh, but in the north we've got this northern settlement here. Uh, that does a couple of things. One, it prevents um, a lot of sieges around here, around what would later be, or what, what was, even during our period, the Moranon. Now you may notice the Moranon is not here as a settlement, and we had a lot of discussion about this. How do we represent this? Uh, it was there, it seems to have been rebuilt, or, or constructed anew out of scratch, um, but regardless, there seems to have been no fighting here, certainly during the Wainrider period. The most relevant point at which fighting could have been expected to occur uh, during the Wainrider period would have been in the campaign of 1944, when the Wainriders, uh, starting off in the east, moved west along the line of the Ash Mountains, and uh, pretty much right around here confronted uh, King Andoher's army. Now, it is said that there were uh, the watchtowers were manned around the Moranon on either side of it, and so to represent that, we do have a couple of watchtowers in the power of Gondor, uh, but the Moranon itself seems not to have been. There is no mention of any siege, no mention of any uh, garrison inside of it. All the fighting happened in the field, and that seems to have been the case throughout pretty much all of Gondor's history, right, until they just uh, entirely abandoned um, everything to do with Mordor, and then Sauron crept back in. So given the absence of a settlement here, and the absence of a settlement uh, here in Dominion of Men, there was one, I think uh, Austin Agarlad was the name of it, on the site of uh, the battle plane. Uh, those settlements are no longer there, which means that armies can suddenly appear and move in and through this region. Uh, you're not likely to get bogged down in sieges around an area where there were no sieges in our period. So that just seems to make sense. Uh, that means that this border is going to be a lot more fluid, and if you're going to be defending your territory, you're going to have to do it by building a fort or just keeping an army up here, or maybe even attacking into the east. Now you can see here that the ownership of the neighbors, this is going to tell you a little bit about what you might expect. Off to the east in southern Ruvanian, we have a rebel settlement. Uh, just to the north, however, the Brownlands is occupied at the beginning of the mod by the Western Horde, one of two Wainrider factions. The other one, Great Rune, is off to the east, quite a bit farther as you might expect. Uh, but because there's a rebel settlement here, there is a possibility that they could roll in uh, before you, and then if they share a border, well, they could be attacking. Uh, but initially, it's set up so that you'll be bordering the Western Horde both along the Anduin uh, and along Northern Athelion. So you're going to have to, as Gondor, defend both of those regions against the Wainriders of Rovanion, so to speak. If you fail to do so, you'll quickly be facing a siege either in northern Athelion or exposed settlements in Kalinardon. And Kalinardon, by the way, looks quite a bit different, I should say, from the Fourth Age, right? There's no Edoras. Uh, that would not come until, oh gosh, 700 years in the future. So who is in the region apart from Gondor? And didn't Gondor control all of this territory? Well, yes. We'll discuss this in more detail in a future video in which we discuss the chiefdom of the Angren, and you can find videos previewing the battle side of things for all of these factions on the channel. But the chiefdom of the Angren will get its own video. In a nutshell, though, what we learn about the settlements around Isengard, the settlements around what would later be Helm's Deep, was that although they were built and initially manned by people of Gondor over time, 
those garrisons loyal to the king seemed to wane. They intermingled with men coming in from the west, from the territory that would later be known as Dunland. And so the idea is that these areas ceased, or at least apparently ceased, to be a major part of Gondor's defense network. To the point, in fact, that when Saruman arrived, uh, right after the long winter, he could easily move in, and the stewards were happy to have him just hand over the keys, uh, take up shop in Orthanc, no big deal, that'll be great. Because they didn't really have anyone, or anyone that they could trust, or anyone that they felt was strong enough to defend the region. So in the Wayne Riders period, given that this part of the map seems to have played no role in events in the east, and given that all we hear about Kalinardon is that it is a, a sort of a region on the Wayne, it seems that we have a bit of scope to suggest that these territories, although friendly to Gondor, and nominally part of its defensive structure, were not really under the direct observation of the kings at this time. So one thing that you will have to keep in mind as a player of Gondor is that your western region, what would later be known as the Gap of Rohan, uh, does not begin in your direct possession. Although you are allied with these people, uh, you may need to keep a close eye on them. But let's go back to the heartland here and then take a trip down the coast. So as we move down through Athelion, again, we're going to be uh, running up into the Poros and then over to the coastlands here where we'll observe that uh, Harondor, as I've said, is going to be a bit of a, uh, a bit of a chaotic region with different factions fighting over rebellious territory. This, after all, is the region described on the map as um, a debatable land uh, that was fought over between the Corsairs and the Kings in the wake of the Kinslaying. And so it seems to have remained for 1,500 years or so. So well within our period, this is not a territory that has been settled in terms of who owns it. But we can move down the coast because we're not quite done with Gondor. Gondor, in fact, does have some territory down here that is very important. Here we've got a settlement uh, of Gondor in the headland, I believe it is. Yes, the Umbar headland, and then Umbar itself. The settlement of Umbar is in the possession of Gondor at the beginning of the campaign. This is a bit of an interesting choice because we hear only that in the year 1810, King Telumetar retook Umbar. He was sick and tired of the Corsairs giving him grief, so he uh, came down here with a great fleet, I believe it was, and finally took Umbar, which we imagine to be basically this entire region, and in that battle destroyed the last descendants of Castamir. Now the Corsairs themselves were not destroyed because they would remain to trouble Gondor for a very long time indeed. And we imagine that the heirs of Castamir, even though their line may have been extinguished, they were not the only line of nobility going back either to Gondor or to old Umbarian times because there were lots of other people from Numenor who had settled the regions of Umbar and southward, and there were lots of rebels or re relatives of the kings of Gondor who ended up fleeing south uh, after the kinslaying and, and basically throughout Gondor's history, it seems, to escape suspicion from the increasingly paranoid kings. So we imagine that even though Castamir's heirs were finally flushed out after the, uh, the Battle of 1810, Umbar itself would remain uh, sort of a, a thorn in Gondor's side, and there would be men who would claim some kind of nobility, some kind of kingship or lordship, essentially. So one of your neighbors in the south, actually your only neighbor initially, is going to be the lordship of Umbar to your north. They will have a presence here around the, uh, the, the mouths of the Harnan River, perhaps a little bit inland, but they're not going to be terribly strong, but then again, neither are you. In fact, you'll have a very small garrison at Umbar, and your enemies will have a bit more power to throw at you. And I like that we've set Gondor up in this precarious position initially, uh, because we don't know exactly when Umbar fell. We know that at some point it did. In Appendix A, where we learn of Telumetar, who took the name Umbar to kill, uh, when we learn of his victorious crushing of Castamir's line in 1810, it is said a couple of sentences later that soon after, in the troubles that soon followed, the haven, the stronghold at Umbar, fell into the hands of the men of the Harad. We don't know precisely when this happened or precisely how it happened. The fact that the language is almost used in a uh, sort of a passive way, it fell into the hands of, suggests to me that there was not a massive assault uh, that there was not a gigantic epic war for Umbar after 1810. It seems instead that Gondor's garrison was very small, 
and that the troubles that soon followed that are referred to in that passage refer to the invasions of the Wainriders, which would have certainly drawn Gondor's attentions back into the north. So this settlement here, Umbar, although it has a great deal of ancestry and proud lineage, uh, is going to be a very difficult one to hold on to in the long term. Now, thinking strategically, we may want to say a word about Mordor, specifically this northwestern portion. Of course, during our period, Mordor played essentially no role in the events of the Wayne Rider invasions. Sauron, of course, would not return here for over a thousand years, and there was no military activity of any kind during our period. So for that reason, combined with the fact that lore-wise, Mordor would have been pretty inhospitable, and gameplay-wise, we don't want factions duking it out over the ruins of the Paradur, we've essentially walled off this northwestern portion of Mordor, making it inaccessible to the player or to other factions. There are, as we've mentioned, a few watchtowers keeping a lookout, sort of as a nod to the historical role of Gondor, keeping an eye on things, but that'll be the limit of the interactivity with this region. And since all we've seen so far is summer, let's see what this place looks like once we hit end season. All right, here we've got our first look at winter on the Wayne Riders map. Uh, you'll notice that in the south, in certain regions, it's, it's more autumnal, I guess you could say. But in the north, we've got a lot more snow cover. But even in the south, where it is, uh, you, you know, it's winter, but there's still some green, there's a lot more sense of frost and chilliness down here. And that changes as you go down south as well. So we'll just kind of move slowly down the coast to give you a sense of that. Yep, here we are down in Umbar. Wintertime, of course, wouldn't look that much different. Uh, south of the Harnan, uh, but north of it, even in Harondor, you've got some difference. One thing I like about this uh, this map is that Harondor seems a lot more akin to Athelion, to Lebanon, to the region of, uh, of I guess, Dol Amroth, Lynn here, uh, than, than it does in, in a lot of other depictions. Uh, so Harondor, of course, is really part of the same biome, wouldn't you say? I mean, there's no massive mountain ranges here, uh, you know, acting as a rain shadow or anything. Uh, so we imagine this wouldn't be terribly arid or dry, uh, but as you move down south, as you move further inland, uh, then certainly that, that might be the case. Up here in the north, though, more forested, generally more fertile uh, region. Uh, but up in Kalinardon, we've got some more chilly textures. Uh, in the turn in between, of course, these uh, neighbors to the west betrayed me. That's what are you going to do, right? Uh, but we've got some nice snowy territory up here into Kalinardon. Kind of going with this theme of decline, right? That we're at a very precarious point in Gondor's history where uh, things are not all going their way and they're going to have to just claw on. Oh, what's this? We've got a new neighbor now. Yep, we've got Great Rune incoming from the east. So we're going to have to worry not just about one enemy Wayne Rider faction, but two. Well, I think that's a good point for us to call this video. This is just a look, an overview of what you can expect to see on a campaign map for Total War Wayne Riders, at least as far as Gondor goes. Now, I'm going to do more of these videos where we will look at the starting position for the factions, talk a little bit about them. Uh, this one, of course, is for Gondor, and for others, uh, you're going to see how the other settlement types look, how the, the minor settlements or the, uh, the villages are going to look, and, of course, how the terrain may have changed from what you may remember from Fourth Age Total War. But I hope you enjoyed this look at Gondor. Stay tuned for future videos where we're going to be going across the map, showing you what you can find in the other corners of Middle-earth in the middle parts of the Third Age. Until the next one, everybody, take care.